Section 47 of Essays, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Max Schörlinge. Essays, Book 1 by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Chapter 47 Of the Uncertainty of Our Judgment Well, says this verse, There is everything much liberty of speech. Iliad, Book 20, 249 For example, Hannibal conquered, but knew not how to make the best use of his victorious venture. Petrarch, son 83. Such as would improve this argument, and condemn the oversight of our leaders in not pushing home the victory at Montcontour, or accuse the king of Spain of not knowing how to make the best use of the advantage he had against us at San Quentin, may conclude these oversights to proceed from a soul already drunk with success, or from a spirit which, being full and overgorged with this beginning of good fortune, had lost the appetite of adding to it, already having enough to do to digest what he had taken in. He has his arms full, and can embrace no more. Unworthy of the benefit fortune has conferred upon him, and the advantage she has put into his hands, for what utility does he reap from it if, notwithstanding, he gives his enemy respite to rally and make head against him? What hope is there? that he will dare at another time to attack an enemy reunited and recomposed, and armed anew with anger and revenge, who did not dare to pursue them when routed and unmanned by fear? Dum fortuna calet, dum conficit omnia terror, whilst fortune is fresh and terror finishes all. Lucan, Book 7, 734 but withal, what better opportunity can he expect than that he has lost? It is not here, as in fencing, where the most hits gain the prize, for so long as the enemy is on foot, the game is new to begin, and that is not to be called a victory that puts not an end to the war. In the encounter where Caesar had the worst, near the city of Oricum, he reproached Pompey's soldiers that he had been lost had their general known how to overcome, and afterwards clawed him in a very different fashion when it came to his turn. But why may not a man also argue, on the contrary, that it is the effect of a precipitous and insatiate spirit not to know how to bound and restrain its coveting, that it is to abuse the favours of God to exceed the measure he has prescribed them, and that again to throw a man's self into danger after victory obtained is again to expose himself to the mercy of fortune, that it is one of the greatest discretions in the rule of war not to drive an enemy to despair? Sill and Marius in the social war, having defeated the Martians, seeing yet a body of reserve that, prompted by despair, was coming on like enraged brutes to dash in upon them, thought it not convenient to stand their charge. Had not Monsieur de Foix's ardour transported him so furiously to pursue the remains of the victory at Ravenna, he had not obscured it by his own death. And yet the recent memory of his example served to preserve Monsieur d'Anguillem from the same misfortune at the battle of Cerisoles. It is dangerous to attack a man you have deprived of all means to escape but by his arms, for necessity teaches violent resolutions. Gravissimi sunt morsus irritate necessitatis. Irritated necessity bites deepest. Portius Latro, declam. Vincitur haud gratis, jugulo qui provocat hostem. He is not readily beaten who provokes the enemy by shewing his throat, or he who presents himself to his foe 
sells his life dear. Lucan, Book 4, 275. This was it that made Pharax withhold the king of Lacedaemon, who had won a battle against the Mantineans, from going to charge a thousand Argians, who had escaped in an entire body from the defeat, but rather let them steal off at liberty, that he might not encounter valour, wetted and enraged by mischance. Clodomir, king of Aquitaine, after his victory pursuing Gondomar, king of Burgundy, beaten and making off as fast as he could for safety, compelled him to face about and make head, wherein his obstinacy deprived him of the fruit of his conquest, for he there lost his life. In like manner, if a man were to choose whether he would have his soldiers richly and sumptuously accounted, or armed only for the necessity of the matter in hand, this argument would step in to favour the first, of which opinion was Sertorius, Philopsimon, Brutus, Caesar, and others, that it is to a soldier an inflaming of courage, and to spur himself in brave attire, and withal a motive to be more obstinate in fight, having his arms, which are in a manner his estate and whole inheritance to defend, which is the reason, says Xenophon, why those of Asia carried their wives and concubines, with their choicest jewels and greatest wealth, along with them to the wars. But then these arguments would be as ready to stand up for the other side, that a general ought rather to lessen in his men their solicitude of preserving themselves than to increase it, that by such means they will be in a double fear of hazarding their persons, as it will be a double temptation to the enemy to fight with great resolution where so great booty and so rich spoils are to be obtained. And this very thing has been observed in former times, notably to encourage the Romans against the Samnites. Antiochus, shewing Hannibal the army he had raised, wonderfully splendid and rich in all sorts of equipage, asked him if the Romans would be satisfied with that army. Satisfied? replied the other. Yes, doubtless, were the avarice never so great. Lycurgus not only forbade his soldiers all manners of bravery in their equipage, but, moreover, to strip their conquered enemies, because he would, as he said, that poverty and frugality should shine with the rest of the battle. At sieges and elsewhere, where occasion draws us near to the enemy, we willingly suffer our men to brave, rate and affront him with all sorts of injurious language, and not without some colour of reason, for it is of no little consequence to take from them all hopes of mercy and composition, by representing to them that there is no fair quarter to be expected from an enemy they have incensed to that degree, nor other remedy remaining but in victory. And yet Vitellius found himself deceived in this way of proceeding, for having to do with Otho, weaker in the valour of his soldiers, long unaccustomed to war, and effeminated with the delights of the city, he so nettled them at last with injurious language, reproaching them with cowardice and regret for the mistresses and entertainments they had left behind at Rome, that by this means he inspired them with such resolution as no exhortation had had the power to have done, and himself made them fall upon him, with whom their own captains before could by no means prevail. And, indeed, when they are injuries that touch to the quick, it may very well fall out that he who went but unwillingly to work in the behalf of his prince will fall to it with another sort of metal when the quarrel is his own. Considering of how great importance is the preservation of the general of an army, and that the universal aim of an enemy is leveled directly at the head upon which all the others depend, the course seems to admit of no dispute, which we know has been taken by so many great captains, of changing their habit and disguising their persons upon the point of going to engage. Nevertheless, the inconvenience a man by doing so runs into is not less than that he thinks to avoid, for the captain, by this means being concealed from the knowledge of his own men, the courage they should derive from his presence and example happens by degrees to cool and to decay, and not seeing the wanted marks and signs of the leader, 
they presently conclude him either dead, or that, despairing of the business, he has gone to shift for himself. And experience shows us that both these ways have been successful and otherwise. What befell Pyrrhus in the battle he fought against the consul Levinus in Italy will serve us to both purposes. For though by shrouding his person on the armor of Megacles and making him wear his own, he undoubtedly preserved his own life, yet, by that very means, he was withal very near running into the other mischief of losing the battle. Alexander, Caesar, and Lucullus loved to make themselves known in battle by rich accoutrements and armor of a particular luster and color. Agis, Agesilaus, and the great Gilippus, on the contrary, used to fight obscurely armed and without any imperial attendance or distinction. Amongst other oversights, Pompey is charged withal at the Battle of Pharsalia. He is condemned for making his army stand still to receive the enemy's charge, by reason that, I shall here steal Plutarch's own words, which are better than mine, he by so doing deprived himself of the violent impression the motion of running adds to the first shock of arms, and hindered that clashing of the combatants against one another, which is wont to give them greater impetuosity and fury, especially when they come to rushing with their utmost vigor, the courage is increasing by the shout and the career, tis to render the soldier's ardor, as a man may say, more reserved and cold. This is what he says. But if Caesar had come by the worse, why might it not as well have been urged by another that, on the contrary, the strongest and most steady posture of fighting is that wherein a man stands planted firm, without motion, and that they who are steady upon the march, closing up, and reserving their force within themselves for the push of the business, have a great advantage against those who are disordered, and who have already spent half their breath in running on precipitately to the charge? Besides that, an army is a body made up of so many individual members, it is impossible for it to move in this fury with so exact a motion as not to break the order of battle, and that the best of them are not engaged before their fellows can come on to help them. In that unnatural battle betwixt the two Persian brothers, the Lacedaemonian Clearchus, who commanded the Greeks of Cyrus' party, led them on softly and without precipitation to the charge, but, coming within fifty paces, heard them on full speed, hoping in so short a career both to keep the order and to husband their breath, and at the same time to give the advantage of impetuosity and impression both to their persons and their missile arms. Others have regulated this question as to their armies, thus if your enemy come full drive upon you, stand firm to receive him. If he stand to receive you, run full drive upon him. In the expedition of the Emperor Charles V into Provence, King Francis was put to choose either to go meet him in Italy, or to await him in his own dominions, wherein though he very well considered of how great advantage it was to preserve his own territory entire and clear from the troubles of war, to the end that, being unexhausted of its stores, it might continually supply men and money at need, that the necessity of war requires at every turn to spoil and lay waste the country before us, which cannot very well be done upon one's own, to which may be added, that the country people do not so easily digest such a havoc by those of their own party as from an enemy, so that seditions and commotions might by such means be kindled amongst us, that the license of pillage and plunder, which are not to be tolerated at home, is at great ease and refreshment against the fatigues and sufferings of war, and that he who has no other prospect of gain than his bare pay will hardly be kept from running home, being but two steps from his wife and his own house, that he who lays the cloth is ever at the charge of the feast, that there is more alacrity in assaulting than defending, and that the shock of a battle's loss in our own bowels is so violent as to endanger the disjointing of the whole body, there being no passion so contagious as that of fear, that is so easily believed, or that so suddenly diffuses itself, and that the cities that should hear the rattle of this tempest at their gates 
that should take in the captains and soldiers yet trembling and out of breath, would be in danger in this heat and hurry to precipitate themselves upon some untoward resolution. Notwithstanding all this, so it was that he chose to recall the forces he had beyond the mountains, and to suffer the enemy to come to him. For he might, on the other hand, imagine that, being at home and amongst his friends, he should not fail of plenty of all manner of conveniences. The rivers and passes he had at his devotion would bring him in both provisions and money in all security, and without the trouble of convoy. That he should find his subjects by so much the more affectionate to him, by how much their danger was more near and pressing. That having so many cities and barriers to secure him, it would be in his power to give the law of battle at his own opportunity and advantage. And that, if it pleased him to delay the time, under cover and at his ease, he might see his enemy founder and defeat himself with the difficulties he was certain to encounter, being engaged in a hostile country, where before, behind, and on every side war would be made upon him. No means to refresh himself, or to enlarge his quarters, should diseases infest them, or to lodge his wounded men in safety. No money, no victuals, but at the point of the lands, no leisure to repose or take breath, no knowledge of the ways or country to secure him from ambushes and surprises, and in case of losing a battle, no possible means of saving the remains. Neither is there want of example in both these cases. Scipio thought it much better to go attack his enemy's territories in Africa than to stay at home to defend his own and to fight him in Italy, and it succeeded well with him. But, on the contrary, Hannibal in the same war ruined himself by abandoning the conquest of a foreign country to go and defend his own. The Athenians, having left their enemy in their own dominions to go over into Sicily, were not favoured by fortune in that design. But Agathocles, king of Syracuse, found her favourable to him when he went over into Africa and left the war at home. By which examples we are wont to conclude, and with some reason, that events, especially in war, for the most part depend upon fortune, who will not be governed by, nor submit, unto human reasons and prudence, according to the poet. Et male consultis pretium est, prudentia fallit, nec fortuna probat causas, sequiturque merentes, sed vaga per cunctos nullo discrimine fertur, Scilicet est aliud, quod nos cugatque regatque, maius et improprias ducat mortalia leges. And there is value in ill counsel, prudence deceives, nor does fortune inquire into causes, nor aid the most deserving, but turns hither and thither without discrimination. Indeed, there is greater power which directs and rules us, and brings mortal affairs under its own laws. Manilius, Book 4, 95 But to take the thing right, it should seem that our counsels and deliberations depend as much upon fortune as anything else we do, and that she engages also our arguments in her uncertainty and confusion. We argue rashly and adventurously, says Timaeus in Plato, by reason that, as well as ourselves, our discourses have great participation in the temerity of chance. End of section 47 Recording by Max Schörlinge Section 48 of Essays, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays, Book 1 by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Of War Horses or Destriers. I have here become a grammarian, I who never learned any language but by rote, and who do not yet know adjective, conjunction, or ablative. 
I think I have read that the Romans had a sort of horses by them called funales or dextrarios, which were either led horses or horses laid on at several stages to be taken fresh upon occasion, and thence it is that we call our horses of service destriers, and our romances commonly use the phrase of a destrer for a compagnie to accompany. They also called those that were trained in such sort, that running full speed side by side, without bridle or saddle, the Roman gentlemen, armed at all pieces, would shift and throw themselves from one to the other, desultorios equos. The Numidian men-at-arms had always a led horse in one hand, besides that they rode upon, to change in the heat of battle. Quibus desultorum in modum, binos trahebintus equos, inter acerimum saepe pugnam, in recentum equum, ex fesso, aramatis transultare mos erat, tanta velocitas ipsis, tamque docile equorum genus. To whom it was a custom, leading along two horses, often in the hottest fight, to leap armed from a tired horse to a fresh one, so active were the men and the horses so docile. Livy, twenty three twenty nine. There are many horses trained to help their riders so as to run upon any one that appears with a drawn sword, to fall both with mouth and heels upon any that front or oppose them, but it often happens that they do more harm to their friends than to their enemies, and moreover you cannot loose them from their hold to reduce them again into order when they are once engaged and grappled, by which means you remain at the mercy of their quarrel. It happened very ill to Artibius, general of the Persian army, fighting man to man, with Onesilus, king of Salamis, to be mounted upon a horse trained after this manner, it being the occasion of his death, the squire of Onesilus cleaving the horse down with a scythe betwixt the shoulders, as it was reared up upon his master. And what the Italians report, that in the battle of Fornova, the horse of Charles the Eighth, with kicks and plunges, disengaged his master from the enemy that pressed upon him, without which he had been slain, sounds like a very great chance if it be true. Note. In the narrative which Philip de Comines has given of this battle, in which he himself was present, Book 8, Chapter 6, he tells us of wonderful performances by the horse on which the king was mounted. The name of the horse was Savoy, and it was the most beautiful horse he had ever seen. During the battle the king was personally attacked, when he had nobody near him but a valet de chambre, a little fellow and not well armed. The king, says Comines, had the best horse under him in the world, and therefore he stood his ground bravely, till a number of his men, not a great way from him, arrived at the critical minute. End note. The Mamalukes made their boast that they have the most ready horses of any cavalry in the world, that by nature and custom they were taught to know and distinguish the enemy, and to fall foul upon them with mouth and heels, according to a word or sign given, as also to gather up with their teeth darts and lances scattered upon the field, and present them to their riders, on the word of command. Tis said, both of Caesar and Pompey, that amongst their other excellent qualities they were both very good horsemen, and particularly of Caesar, that in his youth, being mounted on the bare back, without saddle or bridle, he could make the horse run, stop, and turn, and perform all its airs, with his hands behind him. As nature designed to make of this person, and of Alexander, two miracles of military art, so one would say she had done her utmost to arm them after an extraordinary manner, for every one knows that Alexander's horse, Bucephalus, had a head inclining to the shape of a bull, that he would suffer himself to be mounted and governed by none but his master, and that he was so honoured after his death as to have a city erected to his name. Caesar had also one which had four feet like those of a man, his hoofs being divided in the form of fingers, which likewise was not to be ridden by any but Caesar himself, who, after his death, dedicated his statue to the goddess Venus. I do not willingly alight when I am once on horseback, for it is the place where, whether well or sick, I find myself most at ease. Plato recommends it for health, as also Pliny says it is good for the stomach and the joints. 
let us go further into this matter, since here we are. We read in Xenophon a law forbidding any one who was master of a horse to travel on foot. Trogus Pompeius and Justin say that the Parthians were wont to perform all offices and ceremonies, not only in war, but also in all affairs, whether public or private, make bargains, confer, entertain, take the air, and all on horseback, and that the greatest distinction betwixt free men and slaves amongst them was that the one rode on horseback, and the other went on foot, an institution of which King Cyrus was the founder. There are several examples in the Roman history, and Suetonius more particularly observes it of Caesar, of captains who, on pressing occasions, commanded their cavalry to alight, both by that means to take from them all hopes of flight, as also for the advantage they hoped in this sort of fight. Quo bad dubie superat Romanus, wherein the Roman does questionless excel. Livy 9.22. Says Livy, and so the first thing they did to prevent the mutinies and insurrections of nations of late conquest was to take from them their arms and horses, and therefore it is that we so often meet in Caesar, arma proferi, jumenta produci, obsides dari jubet. He commanded the arms to be produced, the horses brought out, hostages to be given. De bello gallico, 7-2. The Grand Seigneur to this day suffers not a Christian or a Jew to keep a horse of his own throughout his empire. Our ancestors, and especially at the time they had war with the English, in all their greatest engagements and pitched battles, fought for the most part on foot, that they might have nothing but their own force, courage, and constancy to trust to in a quarrel of so great concern as life and honor. You stake, whatever Chrysanthes in Xenophon says to the contrary, your valour and your fortune upon that of your horse. His wounds or death bring your person into the same danger. His fear or fury shall make you reputed rash or cowardly. If he have an ill mouth or will not answer to the spur, your honour must answer for it. And therefore I do not think it strange that those battles were more firm and furious than those that were fought on horseback. Cadabant pariter, pariterque rubant, victorious victique, neque his fuga nota, neque illis. They fought and fell pell-mell, victors and vanquished, nor was flight thought of by either. Aeneid 10.756. Their battles were much better disputed. Nowadays there are nothing but routs. Primus clamor atque impetus rem discernet. The first shout and charge decides the business. Livy 25.41 and the means we choose to make use of in so great a hazard should be as much as possible at our own command. Wherefore I should advise to choose weapons of the shortest sort, and such of which we are able to give the best account. A man may repose more confidence in a sword he holds in his hand than a bullet he discharges out of a pistol, wherein there must be a concurrence of several circumstances to make it perform its office, the powder, the stone, and the wheel." If any of which fail, it endangers your fortune. A man himself strikes much surer than the air can direct his blow. Et, quo ferre velent, permittere vulnera ventis, ensis habet vires. Et gens quaecume virorum est, belagerit gladiis. And so where they choose to carry the arrows, the winds allow the wounds. The sword has strength of arm, and whatever nation of men there is, they wage war with swords. Lucan, 8, 384. But of that weapon I shall speak more fully when I come to compare the arms of the ancients with those of modern use. Only, by the way, the astonishment of the ear abated, which every one grows familiar with in a short time, I look upon it as a weapon of very little execution, and hope we shall one day lay it aside. That missile weapon which the Italians formerly made use of, both with fire and by sling, was much more terrible. They called a certain kind of javelin, armed at the point with an iron three feet long, that it might pierce through and through an armed man, falarica, which they sometimes in the field darted by hand, sometimes from several sorts of engines for the defence of beleaguered places, the shaft being rolled around with flax, wax, rosin, oil, and other combustible matter, took fire in its flight, 
and lighting upon the body of a man or his target, took away all the use of arms and limbs. And yet, coming to close fight, I should think they would also damage the assailant, and that the camp being as it were planted with these flaming truncheons, would produce a common inconvenience to the whole crowd. Magnum stridens contorta fellarica venit, fulminis acta modo. The fellarica, launched like lightning, flies through the air with a loud rushing sound. Aeneid 9705. They had, moreover, other devices which custom made them perfect in, which seem incredible to us who have not seen them, by which they supplied the effects of our powder and shot. They darted their spears with so great force as oft times to transfix two targets and two armed men at once, and pin them together. Neither was the effect of their slings less certain of execution or of shorter carriage. Culling round stones from the beach for their slings, and with these practising over the waves, so as from a great distance to throw within a very small circuit, they became able not only to wound an enemy in the head, but hit any other part at pleasure. Livy, 38.29. Their pieces of battery had not only the execution, but the thunder of our cannon also. At ictus moenum cum terribli sonitu editos, pavor et trepidatio sepit. At the battery of the walls, performed with a terrible noise, the defenders began to fear and tremble. The Gauls, our kinsmen in Asia, abominated these treacherous missile arms, it being their use to fight with greater bravery hand to hand. They are not so much concerned about large gashes, the bigger and deeper the wound, the more glorious do they esteem the combat, but when they find themselves tormented by some arrowhead or bullet lodged within, but presenting little outward show of wound, transported with shame and anger to perish by so imperceptible a destroyer, they fall to the ground. Livy 38.21 a pretty description of something very like an arquebus shot. The ten thousand Greeks in their long and famous retreat met with a nation who very much galled them with great and strong blows, carrying arrows so long that, taking them up, one might return them back like a dart, and with them pierce a buckler and an armed man through and through. The engines that Dionysius invented at Syracuse to shoot vast massy darts and stones of a prodigious greatness with so great impetuosity, and at so great a distance, came very near to our modern inventions. But in this discourse of horses and horsemanship, we are not to forget the pleasant posture of one maestre Pierre Paul, a doctor of divinity, upon his mule, whom Monstrelet reports always to have ridden sideways through the streets of Paris like a woman. He says also, elsewhere, that the Gascons had terrible horses, that would wheel in their full speed, which the French, Picards, Flemings, and Brabanters looked upon as a miracle, having never seen the like before, which are his very words. Caesar, speaking of the Swabians, in the charges they made on horseback, says he, quote, they often throw themselves off to fight on foot, having taught their horses not to stir in the meantime from the place, to which they presently run again upon occasion and according to their custom, nothing is so unmanly and so base as to use saddles or pads, and they despise such as make use of these conveniences, insomuch that, being but a very few in number, they fear not to attack a great many, quote. That which I have formerly wondered at, to see a horse made to perform all his airs with a switch only, and the reins upon his neck, was common with the Messalians, who rid their horses without saddle or bridle. At gens, quae nudo residens Massilia dorso, or a levi flectit, frenorum nesia virga. The Massalians, mounted on the bare backs of their horses, bridleless, guide them by a mere switch. Lucan 4, 682. At numide in fraine singunt. The Numidians guiding their horses without bridles. Aeneid 441. Equi sine frenis, deformis ipse cursus, rigida service et extento capite serentium. The career of a horse without a bridle is ungraceful, the neck extended stiff, and the nose thrust out. Livy 35 2. King Alfonso, 
Note, Alfonso XI, King of Leon and Castile, died 1350, and note, he who first instituted the order of the band or scarf in Spain, amongst other rules of the order, gave them this, that they should never ride mule or mulet, upon penalty of a mark of silver. This I had lately out of Guevara's letters. Whoever gave these the title of the golden epistles had another kind of opinion of them than I have. The courtier says, that till his time it was a disgrace to a gentleman to ride on one of these creatures. But the Abyssinians, on the contrary, the nearer they are to the person of Prester John, love to be mounted upon large mules, for the greatest dignity and grandeur. Xenophon tells us that the Assyrians were fain to keep their horses fettered in the stable, they were so fierce and vicious, and that it required so much time to loose and harness them, that to avoid any disorder this tedious preparation might bring upon them in case of surprise, they never sat down in their camp till it was first well fortified with ditches and ramparts. His Cyrus, who was so great a master in all manner of horse service, kept his horses to their due work, and never suffered them to have anything to eat till first they had earned it by the sweat of some kind of exercise. The Scythians, when in the field and in scarcity of provisions, used to let their horses blood, which they drank, and sustain themselves by that diet. Venit et apoto sarmata pastus equo. The Scythian comes, who feeds on horse flesh. Marshal, de spectaculus libi, epigram 3-4. Those of Crete, being besieged by Metellus, were in so great necessity for drink, that they were fain to quench their thirst with their horse's urine. To show how much cheaper the Turkish armies support themselves than our European forces, tis said that besides the soldiers drink nothing but water, and eat nothing but rice and salt flesh pulverized, of which every one may easily carry about with him a month's provision, they know how to feed upon the blood of their horses as well as the Muscovite and Tartar, and salt it for their use. These new discovered people of the Indies, note, Mexico and Yucatan, D.W., and note, when the Spaniards first landed among them, had so great an opinion both of the men and horses, that they looked upon the first as gods, and the other as animals ennobled above their nature, insomuch that after they were subdued, coming to the men to sue for peace and pardon, and to bring them golden provisions, they failed not to offer of the same to the horses, with the same kind of harangue to them they had made to the others, interpreting their neighing for a language of truce and friendship. In the other Indies, to ride upon an elephant was the first and royal place of honour, the second to ride in a coach with four horses, the third to ride upon a camel, and the last and least honour to be carried or drawn by one horse only. Some one of our late writers tells us that he has been in countries in those parts where they ride upon oxen with pads, stirrups, and bridles, and very much at their ease. Quintus Fabius Maximus Rulanius, in a battle with the Samnites, seeing his horse, after three or four charges, had failed of breaking into the enemy's battalion, took this course, to make them unbridle all their horses and spur their hardest, so that having nothing to check their career, they might through weapons and men open the way to his foot, who by that means gave them a bloody defeat. The same command was given by Quintus Fulvius Flaccus against the Celtibrians. You will do your business with greater advantage of your horse's strength, if you send them unbridled upon the enemy, as it is recorded the Roman horse to their great glory have often done. Their bits being taken off, they charged through and again back through the enemy's ranks with great slaughter, breaking down all their spears. Same source, 4040. The Duke of Muscovy was anciently obliged to pay this reverence to the Tartars, that when they sent an embassy to him, he went out to meet them on foot, and presented them with a goblet of mare's milk, a beverage of greatest esteem among them, and if in drinking a drop fell by chance upon their horse's mane, he was bound to lick it off with his tongue. The army that Bajazet had sent into Russia was overwhelmed with so dreadful a tempest of snow, that to shelter and preserve themselves from the cold, many killed and emboweled their horses, to creep into their bellies, and enjoy the benefit of that vital heat. 
Bajazet, after that furious battle wherein he was overthrown by Tamerlane, was in a hopeful way of securing his own person by the fleetness of an Arabian mare he had under him, had he not been constrained to let her drink her fill at the ford of a river in his way, which rendered her so heavy and indisposed, that he was afterwards easily overtaken by those that pursued him. They say, indeed, that to let a horse stale takes him off his mettle, but as to drinking, I should rather have thought it would refresh him. Croesus, marching his army through certain wastelands near Sardis, met with an infinite number of serpents, which the horses devoured with great appetite, and which Herodotus says was a prodigy of ominous portent to his affairs. We call a horse entire that has his mane and ears so, and no other will pass muster. The Lacedaemonians, having defeated the Athenians in Sicily, returning triumphant from the victory into the city of Syracuse, amongst other insolences, caused all the horses they had taken to be shorn and led in triumph. Alexander fought with a nation called Dahas, whose discipline it was to march two and two together, armed on one horse, to the war, and being in fight, one of them alighted, and so they fought on horseback and on foot, one after another by turns. I do not think that for graceful riding any nation in the world excels the French. A good horseman, according to our way of speaking, seems rather to have respect to the courage of the man than address in riding. Of all that ever I saw, the most knowing in that art, who had the best seat and the best method in breaking horses, was Monsieur de Carnavalet, who served our King Henry the Second. I have seen a man ride with both his feet upon the saddle, take off his saddle, and at his return take it up again and replace it, riding all the while full speed. Having galloped over a cap, make at it very good shots backwards with his bow, take up anything from the ground, setting one foot on the ground and the other in the stirrup, with twenty other ape's tricks, which he got his living by. There has been seen in my time at Constantinople two men upon one horse, who, in the height of his speed, would throw themselves off and into the saddle again by turn, and one who bridled and saddled his horse with nothing but his teeth, another who betwixt two horses, one foot upon one saddle and the other upon another, carrying the other man upon his shoulders, would ride full career, the other standing bolt upright upon, and making very good shots with his bow several who would ride full speed with their heels upward, and their heads upon the saddle betwixt several scimitars, with the points upwards fixed in the harness. When I was a boy, the Prince of Simonia, riding an unbroken horse at Naples, prone to all sorts of action, held reals, note, a small coin of Spain, the two Sicilies, etc., and note, under his knees and toes, as if they had been nailed there, to show the firmness of his seat. End of section 48。section 49 of essays book 1。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。essays book 1 by Michel de Montaigne。translated by Charles Cotton。of ancient customs。I should willingly pardon our people for admitting no other pattern or rule of perfection than their own peculiar manners and customs. For tis a common vice, not of the vulgar only, but almost of all men, to walk in the beaten road their ancestors have trod before them. I am content when they see Fabricius or Lelius, that they look upon their countenance and behavior as barbarous seeing they are neither clothed nor fashioned according to our mode. But I find fault with their singular indiscretion in suffering themselves to be so blinded and imposed upon by the authority of the present usage as every month to alter their opinion, if custom so require, and that they should so vary their judgment in their own particular concern when they wore the busk of their doublets up as high as their breasts, they stiffly maintained that they were in their proper place. Some years after, it was slipped down betwixt their thighs, 
and then they could laugh at the former fashion as uneasy and intolerable. The fashion now in use makes them absolutely condemn the other two with so great resolution and so universal consent that a man would think there was a certain kind of madness crept in amongst them that infatuates their understandings to this strange degree. Now, seeing that our change of fashions is so prompt and sudden that the inventions of all the tailors in the world cannot furnish out new whimwams enough to feed our vanity with all, there will often be a necessity that the despised forms must again come in vogue. These immediately after fall into the same contempt, and that the same judgment must, in the space of fifteen or twenty years, take up half a dozen, not only diverse, but contrary opinions, with an incredible lightness and inconstancy. There is not any of us so discreet who suffers not himself to be gulled with this contradiction, and both in external and internal sight, to be insensibly blinded. I wish to muster up here some old customs that I have in memory, some of them the same with ours, the others different, to the end that, bearing in mind this continual variation of human things, we may have our judgment more clearly and firmly settled. The thing in use amongst us of fighting with rapier and cloak was in practice among the Romans also. Sinistra sagis in volvunt, gladiosque distringunt. They wrapped their cloaks upon the left arm and drew their swords. De Bello Civili, 175, says Caesar. And he observes a vicious custom of our nation that continues yet amongst us, which is to stop passengers we meet upon the road, to compel them to give an account who they are, and to take it for an affront and just cause of quarrel if they refuse to do so. At the baths, which the ancients made use of every day before they went to dinner, and as frequently as we wash our hands, they at first only bathed their arms and legs, but afterwards, and by a custom that has continued for many ages in most nations of the world, they bathed stark naked in mixed and perfumed water, looking upon it as a great simplicity to bathe in mere water. The most delicate and affected perfumed themselves all over three or four times a day. They often cause their hair to be pinched off, as the women of France have some time since taken up a custom to do their foreheads. Quod pectus, quod crura tibi, quod brachia velis. You pluck the hairs out of your breast, your arms and thighs. Marshall 2.62.1 though they had ointments proper for that purpose. Psillo tronited aut acidis latet oblita creta. She shines with unguents or with chalk dissolved in vinegar. Marshall 6, 9. They delighted to lie soft, and alleged it as a great testimony of hardiness to lie upon a mattress. They ate lying upon beds, much after the manner of the Turks in this age. Inde toro paterai neas sic orsus abalto. Thus Father Aeneas, from his high bed of state, spoke. Inid two two. And he said of the younger Cato, that after the battle of Pharsalia, being entered into a melancholy disposition at the ill posture of the public affairs, he took his repasts always sitting, assuming a strict and austere course of life. It was also their custom to kiss the hands of great persons, 
the more to honor and caress them. And meeting with friends, they always kissed in salutation, as do the Venetians. Grata tus cuidarem cum dulcibus oscula verbis. And kindest words I would mingle with kisses. Ovid, De Ponto, 4, 9, 13. In petitioning or saluting any great man, they used to lay their hands upon his knees. Pathocles, the philosopher, brother of Crates, instead of laying his hand upon the knee, laid it upon the private parts, and being roughly repulsed by him to whom he made that indecent compliment. What, said he, is not that part your own as well as the other? Diogenes Laertius, 689. They used to eat fruit, as we do, after dinner. They wiped their fundaments, let the ladies, if they please, mince it smaller, with a sponge, which is the reason that spongia is a smutty word in Latin, which sponge was fastened to the end of a stick, as appears by the story of him who, as he was led along to be thrown to the wild beasts in the sight of the people, asking leave to do his business, and having no other way to dispatch himself, forced the sponge and stick down his throat and choked himself. Seneca, Epistoloi, 70. They used to wipe, after coition, with perfumed wool. At tibi nil faciam sed iota mentula lana. They had, in the streets of Rome, vessels and little tubs for passengers to urine in. Pussi saepe lacum propter se ac dolia curta, somno de vincti credum textolere vestem. The little boys in their sleep often think they are near the public urinal, and raise their coats to make use of it. Lucretius four. They had collation betwixt meals, and had in summer cellars of snow to cool their wine and some there were who made use of snow in winter, not thinking their wine cool enough, even at that cold season of the year. The men of quality had their cup-bearers and carvers, and their buffoons to make them sport. They had their meat served up in winter upon chaffing dishes, which were set upon the table, and had portable kitchens, of which I myself have seen some, wherein all their service was carried about with them. Has wobis epulas habete lauti, nos offendimur ambulante caina. Do you, if you please, esteem these feasts? We do not like the ambulatory suppers. Marshall, 7, 48, 4. In summer, they had a contrivance to bring fresh and clear rills through their lower rooms, wherein were great store of living fish, which the guests took out with their own hands to be dressed every man according to his own liking. Fish has ever had this preeminence, and keeps it still, that the grandees, as to them, all pretend to be cooks, and indeed the taste is more delicate than that of flesh, at least to my fancy but in all sorts of magnificence, debauchery, and voluptuous inventions of effeminacy and expense, we do, in truth, all we can to parallel them, for our wills are as corrupt as theirs, but we want ability to equal them. Our force is no more able to reach them in their vicious than in their virtuous qualities, for both the one and the other proceeded from a vigor of soul, which was without comparison greater in them than in us. And souls, by how much the weaker they are, by so much have they less power to do either very well or very ill. The highest place of honor amongst them was the middle, the name going before or following after, either in writing or speaking, had no signification of grandeur, as is evident by their writings. They will as soon say 
Opius and Caesar, as Caesar and Opius, and me and thee, as thee and me. This is the reason that made me formerly take notice in the life of Flaminius, in our French Plutarch, of one passage where it seems as if the author, speaking of the jealousy of honor betwixt the Aetolians and Romans, about the winning of a battle they had with their joined forces obtained, made it of some importance that in the Greek songs they had put the Aetolians before the Romans, if there be no amphibology in the words of the French translation. The ladies, in their baths, made no scruple of admitting men amongst them, and moreover made use of their serving men to rub and anoint them. Inguina succinctus nigri tibi servus saluta stat, quoties calidis nuda foveris aquis. A slave, his middle girded with a black apron, stands before you. When naked, you take a hot bath. Marshall, 7, 35, 1. They all powdered themselves with a certain powder, to moderate their sweats. The ancient Gauls, says Sidonius Apollinaris, wore their hair long before, and the hinder part of the head shaved, a fashion that begins to revive in this vicious and effeminate age. The Romans used to pay the watermen their fare at their first stepping into the boat, which we never do till after landing. Dum aex exigitur dum mula ligatur tota abit hora. Whilst the fair Spain and the mule is being harnessed, a whole hour's time is past. Chorus Satires 1, 5, 13. The women used to lie on the side of the bed next the wall, and for that reason they called Caesar Spondam Regis Nicomedis, the bed of King Nicomedes, Suetonius, Life of Caesar, 49. They took breath in their drinking, and watered their wine. Quis puer ocius distinguit ardentis falerni pocula praetere unte lympa? What boy will quickly come and cool the heat of the Falernian wine with clear water? Horace, Odes, 2, 6, 18. And the roguish looks and gestures of our lackeys were also in use amongst them. O Iane, a tergo quem nullus ciconi apinsit, nec manus auriculas imitari est mobilis albas, nec lingua quantum sitiat canis apula tantum. O Janus, whom no crooked fingers, simulating a stork, pack at behind your back, whom no quick hands deride behind you, by imitating the motion of the white ears of the ass, against whom no mocking tongue is thrust out, as the tongue of the thirsty Apulian dog. Persius, 1, 58. The Argin and Roman ladies mourned in white, as ours did formerly, and should do still, were I to govern in this point. But there are whole books on this subject. End of section 49section fifty of essays book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter fifty of democritus and heraclitus the judgment is a utensil proper for all subjects and will have an awe in everything which is the reason that in these essays I take hold of all occasions where, though it happened to be a subject I do not very well understand, I try, however, sounding it at a distance, and finding it too deep for my stature, I keep me on the shore. And this knowledge that a man can proceed no further is one effect of its virtue, yes, one of those of which it is most proud. One while in an idle and frivolous subject, I try to find out matter whereof to compose a body, and then to prop and support it. 
Another while I employ it in a noble subject, one that has been tossed and tumbled by a thousand hands, wherein a man can scarce possibly introduce anything of his own, the way being so beaten on every side that he must of necessity walk in the steps of another. In such a case, tis the work of the judgment to take the way that seems best, and of a thousand paths to determine that this or that is the best. I leave the choice of my arguments to fortune, and take that she first presents to me. They are all alike to me. I never design to go through any of them, for I never see all of anything, neither do they who so largely promise to show it to others. Of a hundred members and faces that everything has, I take one, one while to look it over only, another while to ripple up the skin, and sometimes to pinch it to the bones. I give a stab not so wide but as deep as I can, and am for the most part tempted to take it in hand by some new light I discover in it. Did I know myself less, I might perhaps venture to handle something or other to the bottom, and to be deceived in my own inability. But sprinkling here one word and there another, patterns cut from several pieces and scattered without design and without engaging myself too far, I am not responsible for them, or obliged to click close to my subject, without varying at my own liberty and pleasure, and giving up myself to doubt and uncertainty, and to my own governing method, ignorance. All motion discovers us. The very same soul of Caesar, that made itself so conspicuous in marshalling and commanding the battle of Pharsalia, was also seen as solicitous and busy in the softer affairs of love and leisure. A man makes a judgment of a horse, not only by seeing him when he is showing off his paces, but by his very walk, nay, and by seeing him stand in the stable. Amongst the functions of the soul, there are some of a lower and meaner form. He who does not see her in those inferior offices as well as in those of nobler note, never fully discovers her, and peradventure she is best shown where she moves her simpler pace. The winds of passions take most hold of her in her highest flights, and the rather by reason that she wholly applies herself to, and exercises her whole virtue upon, every particular subject, and never handles more than one thing at a time, and that not according to it, but according to herself. Things in respect to themselves have, peradventure, their weight, measures, and conditions, but when we once take them into us, the soul forms them as she pleases. Death is terrible to Cicero, coveted by Cato, indifferent to Socrates. Health, conscience, authority, knowledge, riches, beauty, and their contraries, all strip themselves at their entering into us, and receive a new robe, and of another fashion from the soul. And of what colour, brown, bright, green, dark, and of what quality, sharp, sweet, deep, or superficial, as best pleases each of them. For they are not agreed upon any common standard of forms, rules, or proceedings. Every one is a queen in her own dominions. Let us therefore no more excuse ourselves upon the external qualities of things. It belongs to us to give ourselves an account of them. Our good or ill has no other dependence but on ourselves. Tis there that our offerings and our vows are due, and not to fortune. She has no power over our manners. On the contrary, they draw and make her follow in their train, and cast her in their own mould. Why should I not judge of Alexander at table, ranting and drinking at the prodigious rate he sometimes used to do? Or if he played at chess, what string of his soul was not touched by this idle and childish game? I hate and avoid it, because it is not play enough that it is too grave and serious a diversion, and I am ashamed to lay out as much thought and study upon it as would serve to much better uses. He did not more pump his brains about his glorious expedition into the Indies, nor than in another in unravelling a passage upon which depends the safety of mankind. To what a degree does this ridiculous diversion molest the soul, when all her faculties are summoned together upon this trivial account? and how fair an opportunity she herein gives every one to know and to make a right judgment of himself. I do not more thoroughly sift myself in any other posture than this. What passion are we exempted from in it? Anger, spite, malice, impatience, and a vehement desire of getting the better, in a concern wherein it were more excusable to be ambitious of being overcome. For to be eminent, to excel above the common rate in frivolous things, no wise befits a man of honour. What I say in this example may be said in all others.
Every particle, every employment of man, manifests him equally with any other. Democritus and Heraclitus were two philosophers of whom the first, finding human condition ridiculous and vain, never appeared abroad but with a jeering and laughing countenance, whereas Heraclitus, commiserating that same condition of ours, appeared always with a sorrowful look and tears in his eyes. Alta ridabat quoties alimine muverat unum, protuleratque pedem flebat contrarius alte. The one always, as often as he had stepped one pace from his threshold, laughed, the other always wept. Or as Voltaire, life is a comedy to those who think, a tragedy to those who feel. I am clearly for the first humour, not because it is more pleasant to laugh than to weep, but because it expresses more contempt and condemnation than the other, and I think we can never be despised according to our full desert. Compassion and bewailing seem to imply some esteem of and value for the thing bemoaned, whereas the things we laugh at are by that expressed to be of no moment. I do not think that we are so unhappy as we are vain, or have in us so much malice as folly. We are not so full of mischief as inanity, nor so miserable as we are vile and mean. And therefore Diogenes, who passed away his time in rolling himself in his tub, and made nothing of the great Alexander, esteeming us no better than flies or bladders puffed up with wind, was a sharper and more penetrating, and consequently, in my opinion, a just a judge than Timon, surnamed the man-hater. For what a man hates, he lays to heart. This last was an enemy to all mankind, who passionately desired our ruin, and avoided our conversation as dangerous, proceeding from wicked and depraved natures. The other valued us so little that we could neither trouble nor infect him by our example, and left us to herd one with another, not out of fear, but from contempt of our society, concluding us as incapable of doing good as evil. Of the same strain was Statilius's answer when Brutus courted him into the conspiracy against Caesar. He was satisfied that the enterprise was just, but he did not think mankind worthy of a wise man's concern. According to the doctrine of Hegesias, who said that a wise man ought to do nothing but for himself, for as much as he only was worthy of it, and to the saying of Theodorus that it was not reasonable a wise man should hazard himself for his country, and endanger wisdom for a company of fools. Our condition is as ridiculous as risible. End of section 50section fifty one of essays book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by martin geeson essays book one by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton of the vanity of words a rhetorician of times past said that to make little things appear great was his profession this was a shoemaker who can make a great shoe for a little foot a saying of agesileus they would in sparta have sent such a fellow to be whipped for making profession of a tricky and deceitful act and I fancy that Archidamus, who was king of that country, was a little surprised at the answer of Thucydides, when inquiring of him which was the better wrestler, Pericles or he, he replied that it was hard to affirm, for when I have thrown him, said he, he always persuades the spectators that he had no fall, and carries away the prize. Quintilian, Book Two, Fifteen. The women who paint, pounce, and plaster up their ruins, filling up their wrinkles and deformities, are less to blame, because it is no great matter whether we see them in their natural complexions, 
whereas these make it their business to deceive not our sight only but our judgments and to adulterate and corrupt the very essence of things the republics that have maintained themselves in a regular and well-modelled government such as those of lacedaemon and crete had orators in no very great esteem aristo wisely defined rhetoric to be a science to persuade the people socrates and plato an art to flatter and deceive and those who deny it in the general description verify it throughout in their precepts the mohammedans will not suffer their children to be instructed in it as being useless and the athenians perceiving of how pernicious consequence the practice of it was it being in their city of universal esteem ordered the principal part which is to move the affections with their exordiums and perorations to be taken away it is an engine invented to manage and govern a disorderly and tumultuous rabble and that never is made use of but like physic to the sick in a discomposed state in those where the vulgar or the ignorant or both together have been all-powerful and able to give the law as in those of athens rhodes and rome and where the public affairs have been in a continual tempest of commotion to such places have the orators always repaired and in truth we shall find few persons in those republics who have pushed their fortunes to any great degree of eminence without the assistance of eloquence pompey caesar crassus lucullus lentulus metellus thence took their chiefest spring to mount to that degree of authority at which they at last arrived making it of greater use to them than arms contrary to the opinion of better times for lucius volumnius speaking publicly in favour of the election of quintus fabius and publius decius to the consular dignity these are men said he born for war and great in execution in the combat of the tongue altogether wanting spirits truly consular the subtle eloquent and learned are only good for the city to make praetors of to administer justice livy book ten twenty two eloquence most flourished at rome when the public affairs were in the worst condition and most disquieted with intestine commotions as a free and untilled soil bears the worst weeds by which it should seem that a monarchical government has less need of it than any other for the stupidity and facility natural to the common people and that render them subject to be turned and twined and led by the ears by this charming harmony of words without weighing or considering the truth and reality of things by the force of reason this facility i say is not easily found in a single person and it is also more easy by good education and advice to secure him from the impression of this poison there was never any famous orator known to come out of persia or macedon i have entered into this discourse upon the occasion of an italian i lately received into my service and who was clerk of the kitchen to the late cardinal caraffa till his death i put this fellow upon an account of his office when he fell to discourse of this palate science with such a settled countenance and magisterial gravity as if he had been handling some profound point of divinity he made a learned distinction of the several sorts of appetites of that a man has before he begins to eat and of those after the second and third service the means simply to satisfy the first and then to raise and actuate the other two 
the ordering of the sauces first in general and then proceeded to the qualities of the ingredients and their effects the differences of salads according to their seasons those which ought to be served up hot and which cold the manner of their garnishment and decoration to render them acceptable to the eye after which he entered upon the order of the whole service full of weighty and important considerations nec minimo sane discrimine refert quo gestur lepores et quo galina secetur nor with less discrimination observes how we should carve a hare and how a hen or nor with the least discrimination relates how we should carve hares and how cut up a hen juvenal saturae number five line one hundred and twenty three and all this set out with lofty and magnificent words the very same we make use of when we discourse of the government of an empire which learned lecture of my man brought this of terence into my memory hoc salso est hoc adusto est hoc lautum est parum illud recte iterum sic memento sedulo moneo qui possum pro mea sapientia postremo tamco in speculo in patinas de mea in spicere iubeo et moneo quid facto uso sit this is too salt that's burnt that's not washed enough that's well remember to do so another time thus do i ever advise them to have things done properly according to my capacity and lastly de mea i command my cooks to look into every dish as if it were a mirror and tell them what they should do terence adelphoi act three scene three line seventy one and yet even the greeks themselves very much admired and highly applauded the order and disposition that paulus aemilius observed in the feast he gave them at his return from macedon but i do not here speak of effects i speak of words only i do not know whether it may have the same operation upon other men that it has upon me but when i hear our architects thunder out their bombast words of pilasters architraves and cornices of the corinthian and doric orders and such like jargon my imagination is presently possessed with the palace of apollidon when after all i find them but the paltry pieces of my own kitchen door to hear men talk of metonymies metaphors and allegories and other grammar words would not one think they signified some rare and exotic form of speaking and yet they are phrases that come near to the babble of my chambermaid and this other is a gullery of the same stamp to call the offices of our kingdom by the lofty titles of the romans though they have no similitude of function and still less of authority and power and this also which i doubt will one day turn to the reproach of this age of ours unworthily and indifferently to confer upon any we think fit the most glorious surnames with which antiquity honoured but one or two persons in several ages plato carried away the surname of divine by so universal a consent that never any one repined at it or attempted to take it from him and yet the italians who pretend and with good reason do more sprightly wits and sounder sense than the other nations of their time have lately bestowed the same title upon aretino in whose writings save tumid phrases set out with smart periods ingenious indeed but far-fetched and fantastic and the eloquence be it what it may i see nothing in him above the ordinary writers of his time 
so far is he from approaching the ancient divinity and we make nothing of giving the surname of great to princes who have nothing more than ordinary in them end of section fifty one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section fifty two of essays book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org essays book one by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton of the parsimony of the ancients attilius regulus general of the roman army in africa in the height of all his glory and victories over the carthaginians wrote to the republic to acquaint them that a certain hind he had left in trust with his estate which was in all but seven acres of land had run away with all his instruments of husbandry and entreating therefore that they would please to call him home that he might take order in his own affairs lest his wife and children should suffer by this disaster whereupon the senate appointed another to manage his business caused his losses to be made good and ordered his family to be maintained at the public expense the elder cato returning consul from spain sold his war-horse to save the money it would have cost in bringing it back by sea into italy and being governor of sardinia he made all his visits on foot without other train than one officer of the republic who carried his robe and a censer for sacrifices and for the most part carried his trunk himself he bragged that he had never worn a gown that cost above ten crowns nor had ever sent above ten pence to the market for one day's provision and that as to his country houses he had not one that was rough cast on the outside Scipio Emilianus, after two triumphs and two consulships, went an embassy with no more than seven servants in his train. Tis said that Homer had never more than one, Plato three, and Zeno, founder of the sect of Stoics, none at all. Tiberius Gracchus was allowed but five pence halfpenny a day when employed as public minister about the public affairs and being at that time the greatest man of rome end of section fifty two section fifty three of essays book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org essays book one by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton of a saying of caesar if we would sometimes bestow a little consideration upon ourselves and employ the time we spend in prying into other men's actions and discovering things without us in examining our own abilities we should soon perceive of how infirm and decaying material this fabric of ours is composed is it not a singular testimony of imperfection that we cannot establish our satisfaction in any one thing and that even our own fancy and desire should deprive us of the power to choose what is most proper and useful for us a very good proof of this is the great dispute that has ever been amongst the philosophers of finding out men's sovereign good that continues yet and will eternally continue without solution or accord dum abest quod avemus id ex superare videtur caetera post aliud cum contigit illud avemus et citis aequa tenet while that which we desire is wanting it seems to surpass all the rest then when we have got it we want something else it is ever the same thirst Lucretius three a thousand ninety five. Whatever it is that falls into our knowledge and possession, we find that it satisfies not, 
and we still pant after things to come and unknown, inasmuch as those present do not suffice for us. Not that, in my judgment, they have not in them wherewith to do it, but because we seize them with an unruly and immoderate haste. Nam cum vidit hic ad victum cux flagit at usus, et per quae possent vitam consistere tutam, Omnia iam ferme mortalibus esse parata, divitiis homines et honore et laude potentes, afflue atque bona natorum excellere fama, nec minus esse domi cuiquam tamen anxia corda, atquanimi in gratis vitam vexare querelis causam, quae in festis cogit saivire querelis, intelegit ibi, Vitium vas efficere ipsum, omnia que ilius vitio corrumpere intus, cux colata foris et comoda comque venirent. For when he saw that almost all things necessarily required for subsistence, and which may render life comfortable, are already prepared to their hand, that men may abundantly attain wealth, honor, praise, may rejoice in the reputation of their children, yet that, notwithstanding, every one has none the less in his heart and home anxieties, and a mind enslaved by wearing complaints, he saw that the vessel itself was in fault, and that all good things which were brought into it from without were spoiled by its own imperfections. Lucretius 6.9 Our appetite is irresolute and fickle, it can neither keep nor enjoy anything with a good grace, and man, concluding it to be the fault of the things he is possessed of, fills himself with and feeds upon the idea of things he neither knows nor understands, to which he devotes his hopes and his desires, paying them all reverence and honor, according to the saying of Caesar. Communi fit vitio naturae, ut in visis latitantibus atque incognitis rebus magis confidamus, vehementiusque exteriamur. Tis the common vice of nature, that we at once repose most confidence, and receive the greatest apprehensions from things unseen, concealed, and unknown. The Bello Kiwile 9.4 End of section 53「Section 54 of Essays, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Essays, Book 1 by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Of vain subtleties. There are a sort of little knacks and frivolous subtleties from which men sometimes expect to derive reputation and applause. As poets who compose whole poems with every line beginning with the same letter, we see the shapes of eggs, globes, wings, and hatchets cut out by the ancient Greeks by the measure of their verses making them longer or shorter, to represent such or such a figure. Of this nature was his employment, who made it his business to compute into how many several orders the letters of the alphabet might be transposed, and found out that incredible number mentioned in Plutarch. I am mightily pleased with the humour of him who, having a man brought before him that had learned to throw a grain of millet with such dexterity and assurance as never to miss the eye of a needle, and being afterwards entreated to give something for the reward of so rare a performance, he pleasantly, and in my opinion justly, ordered a certain number of bushels of the same grain to be delivered to him, that he might not want wherewith to exercise so famous an art. Tis a strong evidence of a weak judgment when men approve of things for their being rare and new, or for their difficulty, 
where worth and usefulness are not conjoined to recommend them i come just now from playing with my own family at who could find out the most things that hold by their two extremities as sire which is a title given to the greatest person in the nation the king and also to the vulgar as merchants but never to any degree of men between the women of great quality are called dames inferior gentlewomen demoiselles and the meanest sort of women dames as the first the cloth of state over our tables is not permitted but in the palaces of princes and in taverns democritus said that gods and beasts had sharper sense than men who are of a middle form the romans wore the same habit at funerals and feasts it is most certain that an extreme fear and an extreme ardour of courage equally trouble and relax the belly the nickname of trembling with which they surnamed sancho the twelfth king of navarre tells us that valour will cause a trembling in the limbs as well as fear those who were arming that king or some other person who upon the like occasion was wont to be in the same disorder tried to compose him by representing the danger less he was going to engage himself in you understand me ill said he for could my flesh know the danger my courage will presently carry it into it would sink down to the ground the faintness that surprises us from frigidity or dislike in the exercises of venus are also occasioned by a too violent desire and an immoderate heat extreme coldness and extreme heat boil and roast aristotle says that sows of lead will melt and run with cold and the rigour of winter just as with a vehement heat desire and satiety fill all the gradations above and below pleasure with pain stupidity and wisdom meet in the same centre of sentiment and resolution in the suffering of human accidents the wise control and triumph over ill the others know it not these last are as a man may say on this side of accidents the others are beyond them who after having well weighed and considered their qualities measured and judged them what they are by virtue of a vigorous soul leap out of their reach they disdain and trample them under foot having a solid and well fortified soul against which the darts of fortune coming to strike must of necessity rebound and blunt themselves meeting with a body upon which they can fix no impression the ordinary and middle condition of men are lodged betwixt these two extremities consisting of such as perceive evils feel them and are not able to support them infancy and decrepitude meet in the imbecility of the brain avarice and profusion in the same thirst and desire of getting a man may say with some colour of truth that there is an abecedarian ignorance that precedes knowledge and a doctoral ignorance that comes after it an ignorance that knowledge creates and begets at the same time that it dispatches and destroys the first of mean understandings little inquisitive and little instructed are made good christians who by reverence and obedience simply believe and are constant in their belief in the average understandings and the middle sort of capacities the error of opinion is begotten they follow the appearance of the first impression and have some colour of reason on their side to impute our walking on in the old beaten path to simplicity and stupidity meaning us who have not informed ourselves by study 
the higher and nobler souls more solid and clear-sighted make up another sort of true believers who by a long and religious investigation of truth have obtained a clearer and more penetrating light into the scriptures and have discovered the mysterious and divine secret of our ecclesiastical polity and yet we see some who by the middle step have arrived at that supreme degree with marvellous fruit and confirmation as to the utmost limit of christian intelligence and enjoy their victory with great spiritual consolation humble acknowledgment of the divine favour reformation of manners and singular modesty i do not intend with these to rank those others who to clear themselves from all suspicion of their former errors and to satisfy us that they are sound and firm render themselves extremely indiscreet and unjust in the carrying on of our cause and blemish it with infinite reproaches of violence and oppression the simple peasants are good people and so are the philosophers or whatever the present age calls them men of strong and clear reason and whose souls are enriched with an ample instruction of profitable sciences the mongrels who have disdained the first form of the ignorance of letters and have not been able to attain to the other sitting betwixt two stools as i and a great many more of us do are dangerous foolish and importunate these are they that trouble the world and therefore it is that i for my own part retreat as much as i can towards the first and natural station whence i so vainly attempted to advance popular and purely natural poesy has in it certain artless graces by which she may come into comparison with the greatest beauty of poetry perfected by art as we see in our gascon villanelles and the songs that have brought us from nations that have no knowledge of any manner of science nor so much as the use of writing the middle sort of poesy betwixt these two is despised of no value honour or esteem but seeing that the path once laid open to the fancy i have found as it commonly falls out that what we have taken for a difficult exercise and a rare subject proved to be nothing so and that after the invention is once warm it finds out an infinite number of parallel examples i shall only add this one that were these essays of mine considerable enough to deserve a critical judgment it might then i think fall out that they would not much take with common and vulgar capacities nor be very acceptable to the singular and excellent sort of men the first would not understand them enough and the last too much and so they may hover in the middle region end of section fifty four recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Section 55 of Essays, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Essays, Book 1, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Of Smells. It has been reported of some, as of Alexander the Great, that their sweat exhaled an odoriferous smell, occasioned by some rare and extraordinary constitution, of which Plutarch and others have been inquisitive into the cause. But the ordinary constitution of human bodies is quite otherwise, and their best and chiefest excellency is to be exempt from smell 
nay the sweetness even of the purest breath has nothing in it of greater perfection than to be without any offensive smell like those of healthful children which made plautus say of a woman mulier tum bene olet ubi nihil olet she smells sweetest who smells not at all plautus mostellaria act one scene three one hundred and sixteen and such as make use of fine exotic perfumes are with good reason to be suspected of some natural imperfection which they endeavour by these odours to conceal to smell though well is to stink rides nos coracine nilo lentes malo quam ben olere nilo lere you laugh at us coracinus because we are not scented i would rather than smell well not smell at all marshall book six fifty five four and elsewhere postume non ben olet qui bene semper olet posthumus he who ever smells well does not smell well idem book two twelve fourteen i am nevertheless a great lover of good smells and as much abominate the ill ones which also i scent at a greater distance i think than other men namque sagacius unus odoror polypus and gravis hirsutis cubet ircus in aliis quam canis acer ubi latet sus my nose is quicker to scent a fetid sore or a rank armpit than a dog to smell out the hidden sow horace epodes twelve four of smells the simple and natural seem to me the most pleasing let the ladies look to that for it is chiefly their concern amid the most profound barbarism the scythian women after bathing were wont to powder and crust their faces and all their bodies with a certain odoriferous drug growing in their country which being cleansed off when they came to have familiarity with men they were found perfumed and sleek tis not to be believed how strangely all sorts of odours cleave to me and how apt my skin is to imbibe them he that complains of nature that she has not furnished mankind with a vehicle to convey smells to the nose had no reason for they will do it themselves especially to me my very mustachios which are full perform that office for if i stroke them but with my gloves or handkerchief the smell will not out a whole day they manifest where i have been and the close luscious devouring viscid melting kisses of youthful ardour in my wanton age left a sweetness upon my lips for several hours after and yet i have ever found myself little subject to epidemic diseases that are caught either by conversing with the sick or bred by the contagion of the air and have escaped from those of my time of which there have been several sorts in our cities and armies we read of socrates that though he never departed from athens during the frequent plagues that infested the city he only was never infected physicians might i believe extract greater utility from odours than they do for i have often observed that they cause an alteration in me and work upon my spirits according to their several virtues which makes me approve of what is said that the use of incense and perfumes in churches so ancient and so universally received in all nations and religions was intended to cheer us and to rouse and purify the senses the better to fit us for contemplation 
i could have been glad the better to judge of it to have tasted the culinary art of those cooks who had so rare a way of seasoning exotic odours with the relish of meats as it was particularly observed in the service of the king of tunis who in our days note moulet hassam in fifteen forty three landed at naples to have an interview with charles the emperor his dishes were larded with odoriferous drugs to that degree of expense that the cookery of one peacock and two pheasants amounted to a hundred ducats to dress them after their fashion and when the carver came to cut them up not only the dining-room but all the apartments of his palace and the adjoining streets were filled with an aromatic vapour which did not presently vanish my chiefest care in choosing my lodgings is always to avoid a thick and stinking air and those beautiful cities venice and paris very much lessen the kindness i have for them the one by the offensive smell of her marshes and the other of her dirt end of section fifty five recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Section fifty six of Essays, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Essays, Book One by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Of Prayers i propose formless and undetermined fancies like those who publish doubtful questions to be after disputed upon in the schools not to establish truth but to seek it and i submit them to the judgments of those whose office it is to regulate not my writings and actions only but moreover my very thoughts let what i here set down meet with correction or applause it shall be of equal welcome and utility to me myself beforehand condemning as absurd and impious if anything shall be found through ignorance or inadvertency couched in this rhapsody contrary to the holy resolutions and prescriptions of the catholic apostolic and roman church into which i was born and in which i will die and yet always submitting to the authority of their censure which has an absolute power over me i thus rashly venture at everything as in treating upon this present subject i know not if or no i am wrong but since by a particular favour of the divine bounty a certain form of prayer has been prescribed and dictated to us word by word from the mouth of god himself i have ever been of opinion that we ought to have it in more frequent use than we yet have and if i were worthy to advise at the sitting down to and rising from our tables at our rising from and going to bed and in every particular action wherein prayer is used i would that christians always make use of the lord's prayer if not alone yet at least always the church may lengthen and diversify prayers according to the necessity of our instruction for i know very well that it is always the same in substance and the same thing but yet such a privilege ought to be given to that prayer that the people should have it continually in their mouths for it is most certain that all necessary petitions are comprehended in it and that it is infinitely proper for all occasions tis the only prayer i use in all places and conditions 
and which i still repeat instead of changing whence it also happens that i have no other so entirely by heart as that it just now came into my mind whence it is we should derive that error of having recourse to god in all our designs and enterprises to call him to our assistance in all sorts of affairs and in all places where our weakness stands in need of support without considering whether the occasion be just or otherwise and to invoke his name and power in what state soever we are or action we are engaged in howsoever vicious he is indeed our sole and unique protector and can do all things for us but though he is pleased to honour us with this sweet paternal alliance he is notwithstanding as just as he is good and mighty and more often exercises his justice than his power and favours us according to that and not according to our petitions plato in his laws makes three sorts of belief injurious to the gods that there are none that they concern not themselves about our affairs that they never refuse anything to our vows offerings and sacrifices the first of these errors according to his opinion never continued rooted in any man from his infancy to his old age the other two he confesses men might be obstinate in god's justice and his power are inseparable tis in vain we evoke his power in an unjust cause we are to have our souls pure and clean at that moment at least wherein we pray to him and purified from all vicious passions otherwise we ourselves present him the rods wherewith to chastise us instead of repairing anything we have done amiss we double the wickedness and the offence when we offer to him to whom we are to sue for pardon an affection full of irreverence and hatred which makes me not very apt to applaud those whom i observe to be so frequent on their knees if the actions nearest to the prayer do not give me some evidence of amendment and reformation si nocturnus adulter tempora santonico velas ad operta cuculo if a night adulterer thou coverest thy head with a santonic cowl juvenal satire eight one hundred and forty four editor's note the santones were the people who inhabited saintonge in france from whom the romans derived the use of hoods or cowls covering the head and face and the practice of a man who mixes devotion with an execrable life seems in some sort more to be condemned than that of a man conformable to his own propension and dissolute throughout and for that reason it is that our church denies admittance to and communion with men obstinate and incorrigible in any notorious wickedness we pray only by custom and for fashion's sake or rather we read or pronounce our prayers aloud which is no better than an hypocritical show of devotion and i am scandalized to see a man cross himself thrice at the benedicity and as often at grace and the more because it is a sign i have in great veneration and continual use even when i yawn and to dedicate all the other hours of the day to acts of malice avarice and injustice one hour to god the rest to the devil as if by composition and compensation tis a wonder to see actions so various in themselves succeed one another with such an uniformity of method as not to interfere nor suffer any alteration even upon the very confines and passes from the one to the other 
what a prodigious conscience must that be that can be at quiet within itself whilst it harbours under the same roof with so agreeing and so calm a society both the crime and the judge a man whose whole meditation is continually working upon nothing but impurity which he knows to be so odious to almighty god what can he say when he comes to speak to him he draws back but immediately falls into a relapse if the object of divine justice and the presence of his maker did as he pretends strike and chastise his soul how short soever the repentance might be the very fear of offending the infinite majesty would so often present itself to his imagination that he would soon see himself master of those vices that are most natural and vehement in him but what shall we say of those who settle their whole course of life upon the profit and emolument of sins which they know to be mortal how many trades and vocations have we admitted and countenanced amongst us whose very essence is vicious and he that confessing himself to me voluntarily told me that he had all his lifetime professed and practised a religion in his opinion damnable and contrary to that he had in his heart only to preserve his credit and the honour of his employments how could his courage suffer so infamous a confession what can men say to the divine justice upon this subject their repentance consisting in a visible and manifest reparation they lose the colour of alleging it both to god and man are they so impudent as to sue for remission without satisfaction and without penitence i look upon these as in the same condition with the first but the obstinacy is not there so easy to be overcome this contrariety and volubility of opinion so sudden so violent that they feign are a kind of miracle to me they present us with the state of an indigestible agony of mind it seemed to me a fantastic imagination in those who these late years past were wont to reproach every man they knew to be of any extraordinary parts and made profession of the catholic religion that it was but outwardly maintaining moreover to do him honour forsooth that whatever he might pretend to the contrary he could not but in his heart be of their reformed opinion an untoward disease that a man should be so riveted to his own belief as to fancy that others cannot believe otherwise than as he does and yet worse that they should entertain so vicious an opinion of such great parts as to think any man so qualified should prefer any present advantage of fortune to the promises of eternal life and the menaces of eternal damnation they may believe me could anything have tempted my youth the ambition of the danger and difficulties in the late commotions had not been the least motives it is not without very good reason in my opinion that the church interdicts the promiscuous indiscreet and irreverent use of the holy and divine psalms with which the holy ghost inspired king david we ought not to mix god in our actions but with the highest reverence and caution that poesy is too holy to be put to no other use than to exercise the lungs and to delight our ears it ought to come from the conscience and not from the tongue it is not fit that a prentice in his shop amongst his vain and frivolous thoughts should be permitted to pass away his time and divert himself with such sacred things 
neither is it decent to see the holy book of the holy mysteries of our belief tumbled up and down a hall or a kitchen they were formerly mysteries but are now become sports and recreations tis a book too serious and too venerable to be cursorily or slightly turned over the reading of the scripture ought to be a temperate and premeditated act and to which men should always add this devout preface sursum corda preparing even the body to so humble and composed a gesture and countenance as shall evidence a particular veneration and attention neither is it a book for every one to fist but the study of select men set apart for that purpose and whom almighty god has been pleased to call to that office and sacred function the wicked and ignorant grow worse by it tis not a story to tell but a history to revere fear and adore are not they then pleasant men who think they have rendered this fit for the people's handling by translating it into the vulgar tongue does the understanding of all therein contained only stick at words shall i venture to say further that by coming so near to understand a little they are much wider of the whole scope than before a pure and simple ignorance and wholly depending upon the exposition of qualified persons was far more learned and salutary than this vain and verbal knowledge which has only temerity and presumption and i do further believe that the liberty every one has taken to disperse the sacred writ into so many idioms carries with it a great deal more of danger than utility the jews mohammedans and almost all other peoples have reverentially espoused the language wherein their mysteries were first conceived and have expressly and not without colour of reason forbidden the alteration of them into any other are we assured that in biscay and in brittany there are enough competent judges of this affair to establish this translation into their own language the universal church has not a more difficult and solemn judgment to make in preaching and speaking the interpretation is vague free mutable and of a piece by itself so it is not the same thing one of our greek historians justly censures the age he lived in because the secrets of the christian religion were dispersed into the hands of every mechanic to expound and argue upon according to his own fancy and that we ought to be much ashamed we who by god's especial favour enjoy the pure mysteries of piety to suffer them to be profaned by the ignorant rabble considering that the gentiles expressly forbade socrates plato and the other sages to inquire into or so much as mention the things committed to the priests of delphi and he says moreover that the factions of princes upon theological subjects are armed not with zeal but with fury that zeal springs from the divine wisdom and justice and governs itself with prudence and moderation but degenerates into hatred and envy producing tares and nettles instead of corn and wine when conducted by human passions and it was truly said by another who advising the emperor theodosius told him that disputes did not so much rock the schisms of the church asleep as it roused and animated heresies that therefore all contentions and dialectic disputations were to be avoided and men absolutely to acquiesce in the prescriptions and formulas of faith established by the ancients and the emperor andronicus 
having overheard some great men at high words in his palace with lapodius about a point of ours of great importance gave them so severe a check as to threaten to cause them to be thrown into the river if they did not desist the very women and children nowadays take upon them to lecture the oldest and most experienced men about the ecclesiastical laws whereas the first of those of plato forbids them to inquire so much as into the civil laws which were to stand instead of divine ordinances and allowing the old men to confer amongst themselves or with the magistrate about those things he adds provided it be not in the presence of young or profane persons a bishop has left in writing that at the other end of the world there is an isle by the ancients called dioscorides abundantly fertile in all sorts of trees and fruits and of an exceedingly healthful air the inhabitants of which are christians having churches and altars only adorned with crosses without any other images great observers of fasts and feasts exact payers of their tithes to the priests and so chaste that none of them is permitted to have to do with more than one woman in his life editor's note what osorius says is that these people only had one wife at a time as to the rest so content with their condition that environed with the sea they know nothing of navigation and so simple that they understand not one syllable of the religion they profess and wherein they are so devout a thing incredible to such as do not know that the pagans who are so zealous idolaters know nothing more of their gods than their bare names and their statues the ancient beginning of menalippus a tragedy of euripides ran thus o jupiter for that name alone of what thou art to me is known i have also known in my time some men's writings found fault with for being purely human and philosophical without any mixture of theology and yet with some show of reason it might on the contrary be said that the divine doctrine as queen and regent of the rest better keeps her state apart that she ought to be sovereign throughout not subsidiary and suffragan and that peradventure grammatical rhetorical logical examples may elsewhere be more suitably chosen as also the material for the stage games and public entertainments than from so sacred a matter that divine reasons are considered with greater veneration and attention by themselves and in their own proper style than when mixed with and adapted to human discourse that it is a fault much more often observed that the divines write too humanly than that the humanists write not theologically enough philosophy says saint chrysostom has long been banished the holy schools as an handmaid altogether useless and thought unworthy to look so much as in passing by the door into the sanctuary of the holy treasures of the celestial doctrine that the human way of speaking is of a much lower form and ought not to adopt for herself the dignity and majesty of divine eloquence let who will verbis indisciplinatis talk of fortune destiny accident good and evil hap and other such like phrases according to his own humour i for my part propose fancies merely human and merely my own and that simply as human fancies and separately considered not as determined by any decree from heaven incapable of doubt or dispute 
matter of opinion not matter of faith things which i discourse of according to my own notions not as i believe according to god after a laical not clerical and yet always after a very religious manner as children prepare their exercises not to instruct but to be instructed and might it not be said that an edict enjoining all people but such as are public professors of divinity to be very reserved in writing of religion would carry with it a very good colour of utility and justice and to me amongst the rest peradventure to hold my prating i have been told that even those who are not of our church nevertheless amongst themselves expressly forbid the name of god to be used in common discourse nor so much even by way of interjection exclamation assertion of a truth or comparison and i think them in the right upon what occasion soever we call upon god to accompany and assist us it ought always to be done with the greatest reverence and devotion there is as i remember a passage in xenophon where he tells us that we ought so much the more seldom to call upon god by how much it is hard to compose our soul to such a degree of calmness patience and devotion as it ought to be in at such a time otherwise our prayers are not only vain and fruitless but vicious forgive us we say our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us what do we mean by this petition but that we present to god a soul free from all rancour and revenge and yet we make nothing of invoking god's assistance in our vices and inviting him into our unjust designs quae nisi seductis nequeas committere divis which you can only impart to the gods when you have gained them over perseus two four the covetous man prays for the conservation of his vain and superfluous riches the ambitious for victory and the good conduct of his fortune the thief calls him to his assistance to deliver him from the dangers and difficulties that obstruct his wicked designs or returns him thanks for the facility he has met with in cutting a man's throat at the door of the house men are going to storm or break into by force of a petard they fall to prayers for success their intentions and hopes of cruelty avarice and lust hoc igitur quo tu jovis aurem pelere tentas dic agidum staio pro jupiter o bone clamet jupiter at sese non clamet jupiter ipse this therefore with which you seek to draw the ear of jupiter say to stius o jupiter o good jupiter let him cry think you jupiter himself would not cry out upon it perseus two twenty one marguerite queen of navarre in the heptameron tells of a young prince who though she does not name him is easily enough by his great qualities to be known who going upon an amorous assignation to lie with an advocate's wife of paris his way thither being through a church he never passed that holy place going to or returning from his pious exercise but he always kneeled down to pray wherein he would employ the divine favour his soul being full of such virtuous meditations i leave others to judge which nevertheless she instances for a testimony of singular devotion 
but this is not the only proof we have that women are not very fit to treat of theological affairs a true prayer and religious reconciling of ourselves to almighty god cannot enter into an impure soul subject at the very time to the dominion of satan he who calls god to his assistance whilst in a course of vice does as if a cut-purse should call a magistrate to help him or like those who introduce the name of god to the attestation of a lie tacito mala vota susurro concipimus we whisper our guilty prayers lucan five one hundred and four there are few men who durst publish to the world the prayers they make to almighty god haud cui vis prompto est murmurque humilesque susurros tolere de templis et aperto vivere voto tis not convenient for every one to bring the prayers he mutters out of the temple and to give his wishes to the public ear perseus two six and this is the reason why the pythagoreans would have them always public and heard by every one to the end they might not prefer indecent or unjust petitions as this man clare cum dixit apollo labra movet metuens audiri pulcra laverna da mihi valere da justum sanctum que videri noctem peccatis et fraudibus obique nubem when he has clearly said apollo he moves his lips fearful to be heard he murmurs o fair laverna grant me the talent to deceive grant me to appear holy and just shroud my sins with night and cast a cloud over my frauds horace epodes one sixteen fifty nine editor's note laverna was the goddess of thieves the gods severely punished the wicked prayers of oedipus in granting them he had prayed that his children might amongst themselves determine the succession to his throne by arms and was so miserable as to see himself taken at his word we are not to pray that all things may go as we would have them but as most concurrent with prudence we seem in truth to make use of our prayers as of a kind of jargon and as those do who employ holy words about sorceries and magical operations and as if we reckoned the benefit we are to reap from them as depending upon the contexture sound and jingle of words or upon the grave composing of the countenance for having the soul contaminated with concupiscence not touched with repentance or comforted by any late reconciliation with god we go to present him such words as the memory suggests to the tongue and hope from thence to obtain the remission of our sins there is nothing so easy so sweet and so favourable as the divine law it calls and invites us to her guilty and abominable as we are extends her arms and receives us into her bosom foul and polluted as we at present are and are for the future to be but then in return we are to look upon her with a respectful eye we are to receive this pardon with all gratitude and submission and for that instant at least when we address ourselves to her to have the soul sensible of the ills we have committed and at enmity with those passions that seduced us to offend her neither the gods nor good men says plato will accept the present of a wicked man in munis aram si tetigit manus non sumptuosa blandior hostia molivit aversos penates 
fare pio et saliente mica if a pure hand has touched the altar the pious offering of a small cake and a few grains of salt will appease the offended gods more effectually than costly sacrifices horace odes book three twenty three seventeen End of section 56。section 57 of essays book 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Essays, Book One, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Of Age. I cannot allow of the way in which we settle for ourselves the duration of our life. I see that the sages contract it very much in comparison of the common opinion. What, said the younger Cato to those who would stay his hand from killing himself, am I now of an age to be reproached that I go out of the world too soon? And yet he was but eight and forty years old. He thought that to be a mature and advanced age considering how few arrive unto it and such as soothing their thoughts with i know not what course of nature promised themselves some years beyond it could they be privileged from the infinite number of accidents to which we are by a natural subjection exposed they might have some reason so to do what an idle conceit is it to expect to die of a decay of strength which is the effect of extremest age and to propose to ourselves no shorter lease of life than that considering it is a kind of death of all others the most rare and very seldom seen we call that only a natural death as if it were contrary to nature to see a man break his neck with a fall be drowned in shipwreck be snatched away with a pleurisy or the plague and as if our ordinary condition did not expose us to these inconveniences let us no longer flatter ourselves with these fine words we ought rather peradventure to call that natural which is general common and universal to die of old age is a death rare extraordinary and singular and therefore so much less natural than the others tis the last and extremest sort of dying and the more remote the less to be hoped for it is indeed the bourne beyond which we are not to pass and which the law of nature has set as a limit not to be exceeded but it is with all a privilege she is rarely seen to give us to last till then tis a lease she only signs by particular favour and it may be to one only in the space of two or three ages and then with a pass to boot to carry him through all the traverses and difficulties she has strewed in the way of this long career and therefore my opinion is that when once forty years we should consider it as an age to which very few arrive for seeing that men do not usually proceed so far it is a sign that we are pretty well advanced and since we have exceeded the ordinary bounds which is the just measure of life we ought not to expect to go much further having escaped so many precipices of death whereinto we have seen so many other men fall we should acknowledge that so extraordinary a fortune as that which has hitherto rescued us from those eminent perils and kept us alive beyond the ordinary term of living 
is not like to continue long tis a fault in our very laws to maintain this error these say that a man is not capable of managing his own estate till he be five-and-twenty years old whereas he will have much ado to manage his life so long augustus cut off five years from the ancient roman standard and declared that thirty years old was sufficient for a judge servius tullius superseded the knights of above seven and forty years of age from the fatigues of war augustus dismissed them at forty-five though methinks it seems a little unreasonable that men should be sent to the fireside till five-and-fifty or sixty years of age i should be of opinion that our vocation and employment should be as far as possible extended for the public good i find the fault on the other side that they do not employ us early enough this emperor was arbiter of the whole world at nineteen and yet would have a man to be thirty before he could be fit to determine a dispute about a gutter for my part i believe our souls are adult at twenty as much as they are ever like to be and as capable then as ever a soul that has not by that time given evident earnest of its force and virtue will never after come to proof the natural qualities and virtues produce what they have of vigorous and fine within that term or never si l'épine non pique qu'en est à peine que pique jamais if the thorn does not prick at its birth twill hardly ever prick at all as they say in dauphine of all the great human actions i ever heard or read of of what sort soever i have observed both in former ages and our own more were performed before the age of thirty than after and this oft times in the very lives of the same men may i not confidently instance in those of hannibal and his great rival scipio the better half of their lives they lived upon the glory they had acquired in their youth great men after tis true in comparison of others but by no means in comparison of themselves as to my own particular i do certainly believe that since that age both my understanding and my constitution have rather decayed than improved and retired rather than advanced tis possible that with those who make the best use of their time knowledge and experience may increase with their years but vivacity promptitude steadiness and other pieces of us of much greater importance and much more essentially our own languish and decay ubi iam validis quasato est viribus aevi corpus et obtusis ceciderunt viribus artus claudicat ingenium delirat linguaque mensque when once the body is shaken by the violence of time blood and vigour ebbing away the judgment halts the tongue and the mind dote lucretius book three fine four hundred and fifty two sometimes the body first submits to age sometimes the mind and i have seen enough who have got a weakness in their brains before either in their legs or stomach and by how much the more it is a disease of no great pain to the sufferer and of obscure symptoms so much greater is the danger for this reason it is that i complain of our laws not that they keep us too long to our work but that they set us to work too late for the frailty of life considered and to how many ordinary and natural rocks it is exposed one ought not to give up so large a portion of it to childhood idleness and apprenticeship editorial note 
which cotton thus renders birth though noble ought not to share so large a vacancy and so tedious a course of education florio sixteen thirteen makes the passage read as follows methinks that considering the weakness of our life and seeing the infinite number of ordinary rocks and natural dangers it is subject unto we should not as soon as we come into the world allot so large a share thereof unto unprofitable wantonness in youth ill-breeding idleness and slow learning prenticeage End of section fifty seven. Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. End of Essays, Book One by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton.